Welcome to the February video companion of my NFTA Director Magazine article, Finance 201. That's right. Remember, you graduated. It's now Finance 201. The February issue deals with two topics that seemingly are unrelated. Memorialization and green funerals. So what do these two items have in common? Well, I did some research and I've arrived at the concept that an English artist by the name of Banksy, Banksy is an eclectic artist and he came up with this quote which I think is marvelous. Banksy says, we die twice. Once, when we breathe our last breath, and the second is the last time our name is mentioned. To me, Banksy has encapsulated the entire concept of memorialization. So I reached out to two very astute people to interview for this column, so that way we can get their points of view. The first person I spoke to is Jay Dietz. Jay is the Vice President in Charge of Operations for a company called The Verton Companies. Verton is a multiple location owner-operator who owns funeral homes in the north central and northwestern part of the United States from Wisconsin through the north and south Dakotas, Minnesota and west. Jay is in charge of all the operations, training, and his job is to work with all of the funeral directors and the funeral home managers that they have and try to help them be the best that they can be in serving their families. And during a time of a pandemic, it has never been more difficult. But the concept of green funeral or natural funeral or what I say, kosher. Tying that together with memorialization was much more difficult. I found a guy named Brian Flowers. Brian is a funeral director and he's the director of the natural burial site at Moles Farewell Tributes in Bellingham, Washington, up near the Canadian border. Moles Farewell Tributes owns a few funeral homes and a cemetery. And the cemetery has a classic interment site, a cremation garden, and a natural burial garden. And Brian designed and runs the natural burial garden. Brian's also a past president of the Green Burial Council, as well as a professional storyteller. And trust me, you will love hearing him tell his stories. The key to operating a funeral home and a cemetery and helping families memorialize during a time when they may not be able to come together and hug, everything that they used to be able to do, they're not able to do any longer, takes creativity and a desire to serve. I think you'll enjoy hearing both of their stories. Welcome to another interview on Finance 201. Today I'm going to be talking with Jay Dietz, the Vice President of Operations for the Verton Companies. Verton is a multiple location owner, operator of funeral homes and cemeteries throughout the North and Northwest. Jay joined the Verton Companies in 1995. He's a licensed funeral director and oversees uh, the operations of the entire enterprise. Jay, welcome to Finance 201. Thank you, Dan, glad to be here. Jay, today our, our topic of conversation is memorialization and how it's changing in light of the pandemic, as well as how it would have changed just naturally. There's a quote that I discovered by an eccentric artist 
named Banksy, uh, an Englishman. And, and Banksy has a quote theory that uh, we die twice. We die once when we breathe our last breath. And we die a second time when our name is said for the last time. And memorialization, I infer, it is intended to delay that second death. So what are you seeing in the field and in your locations as it pertains to changes in funeral business and the way families are mourning and memorializing? Uh, this is an important topic and one that has really impacted this entire industry and uh, our company specifically. So as we, as we look at the changes that have happened as a result of COVID-19 most recently uh, in an already changing industry, I would say a couple of the biggest things that we have seen in our company that families have always wanted to and they continue to want to gather and participate in honoring their loved one. Only this year with COVID-19, there is a focus on doing this remotely or virtually and still having a meaningful experience. Um, I would say our company, we were very fortunate. We had started to invest in some of this technology before COVID-19 uh, became a real thing for the industry. So we had already wanted to use this to expand our webcasting services that we had already done. Uh, in many of our locations, but also we wanted to uh, enhance and become more efficient with how we do meetings across the seven state uh, industry or company. And so we had put in place uh, cameras, monitors, microphones, all of those types of things prior to COVID-19. So when that happened and the world began to experience shutdowns, it uh, became a real differentiator for our locations, first of all that we were able to provide important services like live streaming of, of uh, memorial services, funerals um, to families that came into our locations. And we were able to do that immediately. Um, remote arrangements became a very real thing as, as people maybe contracted COVID-19 or they were afraid of contracting COVID-19. So we were able to work with some of our suppliers, merchandisers who also have that technology and be able to completely do virtual arrangements uh, for the first time. And uh, we used other tools um, such as DocuSign to make sure that we were still able to legally bring things to closure, um, finalize contracts, uh, finalize payment arrangements, all those things uh, through a variety of different tools that our company enhanced. So. We have some great people. Uh, certainly, I am not here to take credit for this. Uh, we have great people around us. Our IT department did a phenomenal job of putting together live streaming equipment, um, and they packaged it all in a nice backpack and a little carrying case, so it's easy for our locations to transfer it around, set it up, use it, using the latest iPads, external cameras for enhanced video, um, a variety of microphones that they put in that I could not explain to you to enhance the audio experience for people, the tripods, everything was put together by a phenomenal IT team that supports all of our locations. So this all came together to really enhance the service our families experienced. I would say the other biggest change, Dan, that we experienced uh, across our company was for the first time, people were afraid. They personally were uh, afraid of their own safety if they were to come to facilities and gather and memorialize their loved ones. This is unique. This is not something that we had dealt with before. Uh, so things that we did to try and um, help them with that fear was made sure we had preparedness plans in place that could be shared with anyone if they had questions about how we were proceeding. Uh, we had crowd control measures that were very clear and shared with all of our locations. So they knew how to handle a situation if they were overwhelmed by people that didn't fall under the mandates that we were trying to follow. Uh, cleaning procedures, simple things like that. Um, social distancing. People needed to know uh, not only that we would say we were taking care of them, but they needed the visual proof that there was markings on the floor on how, how to be spaced out in our chapels. There was roping so that families could be 
uh, sequestered, if you will, in an area that still gave them access to family or to the visitors, but uh, they didn't um, they didn't have that hugging that was happening. Now that's that's a great thing normally, but for a lot of families, they were very afraid because some people would come in that have no fear of the virus, and uh, you know to try and protect that family uh, as much as we could was really an important thing for them. We were able to do viewings for families virtually. And uh, that was not something that we had really done widely uh, previously. But this new technology, it was a, a unique time because families were open to new things like they have never been before uh, because of the impacts of COVID-19. So I could, I could probably go on, Dan, for uh, two hours just on that uh, question alone, but I'll leave it there unless you have any clarifying questions. I'm curious, Jay, about whether you're seeing any difference based upon the size of the market. Obviously, you own funeral homes in some markets that are 10,000, 20,000 service area or less. And then you operate in some of America's uh, top 100 metropolitan service areas. Is there a difference in the way consumers think and behave to these newfangled ideas? Today, the reality is much different. Every one of our communities is dealing with COVID-19 numbers and the cases are rising. So uh, today it is a different uh, situation, of course. But, you know, it's, it's great to see that people value the service that we have always provided and they wanted to con continue to have that. And that's a springboard we hope to, that will be there as we get the vaccine out and we can get back to those uh, normal days, if you will. Um, but... Today, what we're seeing is that everyone, and actually everyone did embrace the, the remote access, the live streaming, all of those things. They embrace that right away because there's just a different level of fear um, in every, every individual. And honestly, if I had to say, I think this is one thing that will always be with us. The live streaming, the, the virtual attendance will always be with us. And although COVID-19 dramatically reduced how many people could be at a service in person, I honestly think in many cases, Dan, we have seen an increase in attendance at funerals because people that maybe previously would not have been able to attend can now pull up on their smartphone, go to our website and log into the service and enjoy it from wherever they're at. The, the other beauty, and it, it speaks to the quote that you shared at the beginning about dying the second time that we're trying to prevent from happening is that as we live stream, it's all, it's being recorded and it's being saved on our websites. So people not only can experience that service once like they historically have done, but they can go back as many times as they want and they can relive that experience and benefit from the healing pieces of it. It's like a great movie. You watch a movie and you love it. You watch it a second, third and fourth time. You see something new every time. And people are experiencing the same thing when they go back and, and review their loved ones services. So there's some, there's some benefits that have come out of this in, in all markets. It almost seems, and since you and I have been lifers to this profession, somewhere around 2005, 2010, we started seeing more and more offers of technology to complement the, the funeral and memorial experience. And it never really caught on, but obviously it appears that uh, COVID-19 and, and the societal fears uh, of infection uh, have almost pushed the technology that we didn't embrace to something that consumers are now embracing. Is that your perception? Absolutely. We have tried to embrace technology for a number of years, but because there wasn't that, that push from the consumer side, it was really actually hard to get our own associates behind it. So we have actually done webcasting in, in some locations for, uh, I believe we're around that eight to 10 year period now that we have experience with webcasting and posting those videos. But to get the buy-in from, from our own associates, and that's not a dig on our people, of course, they're great, but they weren't hearing the, the consumer ask for this. So they were putting their energy where they thought it should be placed at the time. 
the minute the consumer asked for it, uh, our usage skyrocketed. And we're, we're doing it in every market across the company. The consumer is fully embracing it. They're appreciative of it. And uh, it's, it is one of the positives that have come out of it because it helps more people grieve. Uh, and it doesn't matter where they're at. They can be anywhere on the globe and uh, still benefit from that service that's happening. Jay, I, I respect you for not wanting to take a dig at the industry, but being one of the most arrogant <laughs> people in the industry, I, I will tell you that in my 40 years, I've learned that this industry not only does not embrace technology, the last technology it universally embraced was gravity. So uh, I, I respect the fact you didn't want to go there, but but I will. Well, I get enough emails the way it is, Dan, so I don't, <laughs> I don't need to filter out more uh, hate emails. So... Our industry likes their tradition. <laughs> yes, they do. Jay, you talked a little bit about uh, helping your people be prepared for the future. How have you worked to help them prepare themselves to protect themselves from the disease, as well as help to keep the community safe through a funeral? So we, we spent a lot of time on communication with our associates because this was an unknown challenge and we, we decided on very specific procedures and processes uh, to keep our people safe. And they needed to know that that was a primary concern of ours, Dan, for them to continue to answer those calls and go into those environments that simply were not safe if you didn't do it correctly. So to come up with procedures from how to answer that call, if it was a COVID-19 death, how to guide that family on our preferences of how to interact if they had exposures themselves, how to remove a body uh, that had died of COVID-19 to make sure that, um, that that virus wasn't expelled through any movement and very specific procedures on how to do that. And those were trainings that we would put together and we would share in PowerPoint uh, presentation style company-wide by using um, Microsoft Teams as the the technology of choice for our company, but we would use that similar to Zoom and share it company-wide, first of all, so that we can walk through it, explain point by point um, how we wanted them to do these different procedures to keep themselves safe, to keep the people they were serving safe. And then we would share those, those decks, if you will, with all of our organization and answer questions that they might have and as always, we were, we were ready for phone calls at, at any hour to answer any situations or help them through situations they might walk into. So it was a really important push for our company to keep our associates safe and um, something that I, I felt really proud about how uh, the message was communicated to them, but also how it was received, taken seriously and implemented immediately. My guest today for this section of Finance 201 has been Jay Dietz. Jay is the Vice President of Operations for the Verton Company, a multiple location owner or operator of funeral homes throughout the North and Northwest. Jay, thank you very much for your thoughts and comments today. Thank you for having me, Dan. I, the, the topic is important and it's extremely relevant. So I'm just honored to be able to participate in this. Yeah great industry and, and you're part of that as well. So thank you for bringing this to the surface. Excellent. Thank you. Today I have the privilege of talking to Brian Flowers. We're going to be talking about memorialization and green funerals as well as interment. Brian, welcome to Finance 201. Thank you, Dan. It's good to be here. It's great having you. We've known each other for a while, and, and uh, you come into funeral service in one of the more unusual modern ways, but a very common old way. You came in as a fine woodworker. Yes. And, and it seemed that your passion for woodworking uh, and then the natural burial, the natural processes mm -hmm. uh, of the great Northwest where you reside, uh, brought you into funeral service. It did. Yeah. I was, uh, let's see, 13 years ago now, 14 almost, working as a cabinet and furniture maker in a small custom high-end woodworking shop 
and we were working on a pine kitchen going into this ridiculous 7,500 square foot mansion, but that's a different story. <laughs> the pantry at one stage of its construction, Dan, as it was laying on the shop deck, looked like a plain pine casket. And the gentleman that I worked for uh, had glanced at their business license that week and noted that they were licensed as cabinet and casket makers, which as we both know is really a throwback to 150, 200 years ago, when oftentimes the first undertakers were your local cabinet and furniture makers. And they started connecting the dots, thinking, what would it look like for us to make inexpensive plain pine caskets? And John Moles, who I now work for, is an old family friend. So I called him up to pick his brain about price points, distribution, that sort of thing. And he said in that first conversation, you know, there's a casket maker uh, just about 50 miles from us that we work with that specializes in plain pine caskets. Economies of scale, they can probably... Uh, I can probably get that final product for about what you guys get your materials for. And he was familiar with the shop. We specialized in local and sustainably harvested woods. And in that initial conversation, John said, you know, if I could get a, a locally made, sustainably harvested solid wood casket, we could talk about green burial though. And of course I said, what's green burial? And he gave me the nutshell definition, no embalming, 100% biodegradable uh, container, no outer burial container, and it's also occasionally being used as a vehicle for ecological restoration and landscape level conservation. And I thought, well, that's cool. That's what I always said I wanted for myself. I didn't know it was possible. I didn't think it was legal, but here it was. And this was, like I said, almost 14 years ago, and green burial was incredibly nascent in the United States at that point in time. Uh, there were three green burial cemeteries in existence and only a small handful of funeral homes that even really knew what this was. And I had my imagination captured like nothing ever had. I started waxing philosophic to the guys I worked with about, oh, the Cartesian mind-body duality and nothing epitomizes our divorce from the natural world more than contemporary burial practices. And shut up, Brian, and go sand something. After about a year of, of contemplating this, talking about uh, with John I, uh, over a few more meetings, I called him up and uh, said, hey, can we talk? He said, yeah, come on out to Green Acres, the, the funeral home and memorial park he has. So I found my one pair of khaki pants, my one kind of hippie broidered button down shirt. It was a button down though. Blew all the sawdust out of the nooks and crannies and went to the funeral home to talk to the owner. And we had in that initial conversation, sat down and I said, you know, John, I can't stop thinking about Green Barrel. I'm waking up in the middle of the night thinking about these possibilities. It is so brand new that I don't imagine it's on your staff's radar yet. And I know you want it to happen. You've shared all these articles that you clipped out of trade journals with me. We've had these conversations, but you're a business owner. You don't have time to put this together. If there's room on your team, bring me on board and I will make this happen. And he said, let's find room. So one month later, I got rid of the uh, hooded sweatshirts and the car hearts, figured out how to tie a tie, how to polish my shoes and started working at the funeral home. And six months later, we opened the Meadow Natural Burial Ground at Green Acres, which at the time was the 12th green burial cemetery in the country and the first uh, natural burial ground, which is a certification level by the Green Burial Council uh, in an existing conventional cemetery and the first green cemetery in Western Washington. And from there, a career launched. So, Brian, just to get the, the background straight, we mentioned a number of names. First of all, you mentioned John Moles. Yeah. John is the old owner of Moles Farewell Tributes and Crematory, a couple of funeral homes, and a cemetery with a green burial option. You're the managing funeral director, uh, and you also manage the uh, green burial part of the cemetery. Exactly. Yep. I'm the green burial coordinator, we call it. <laughs> now, you've also mentioned the Green Burial Council, which is a, a trade association within the funeral and cemetery world. And in fact, you are the second, now the past president, but the second uh, past president of, of the organization behind the founder, Joe Sehe. Correct. So Joe Sehe incorporated the Green Burial Council uh, to be a third party trust provider, certifying green burial offerings, much like we certify organic or non-GMO foods to uh, 
make sure that there was verifiable data held by a third party that uh, verified the claims that were being made by these providers, uh, cemeteries, funeral homes, and then products. And, and the last part of your background uh, uh, to, to comment on is we talk about the Northwest. You're in Northwestern Washington State uh, in Bellingham. Uh, so you're not too far from the Pacific Ocean and not too far from Canada. Correct. In fact, we are a stone's throw from the Canadian border. Uh, we're the, the northernmost county in Washington State. And we've got the Salish Sea or the Puget Sound right out our back door and then the Olympic Peninsula and the broad, wide open Pacific Ocean. Okay, and the last thing, which is in your biography, not, not very well known, is that you are a performer uh, as a storyteller. Yes, yeah, I've worked as a, more moonlighting these days than, uh, than vocation, but have worked for about 25 years now as a professional performing storyteller. And I gotta tell you, it's one of the funnest things I can do. Well, let's see if we could spin your avocation okay. into the profession as we talk about the green movement, and especially as it relates to memorialization. Mm -hmm. What is it that green consumers are really looking for in the way of memorialization? That's a pretty broad question, Dan. Um, I think we need to start out with identifying the, the fact that green consumers are coming to funeral homes and cemeteries, uh, having educated themselves for the most part. They are uh, smart, savvy, and oftentimes jaded about what's out there. They've looked around, they may have uh, encountered uh, a provider who is claiming to offer green services, but they start peeling back the layers and they realize that it's really uh, a, more of a disposable marketing tactic for them. And they have discovered that they need to be uh, on the defensive almost at times. So a green provider in the funeral industry really has to have their values aligned with their offerings because the green consumer is gonna see through it pretty quickly if that's not the case. Brian, let's make sure that we understand what your definition is of a natural burial, a green burial, uh, so that we get rid of any uh, of, of the uh, wolf and sheep's clothing Absolutely. that may be out there. Absolutely. So green burial essentially is a cemetery function. Burial is full body burial without embalming or with a Green Burial Council certified embalming product, which there is one uh, line of embalming products out there that are all plant-based non-toxic uh, that the Green Burial Council certifies. But generally, Green Burial takes place without embalming in a 100% biodegradable container. That could be a solid wood casket that could be a woven wicker or banana leaf casket. That could be a cloth burial shroud. It might be a handmade lowering pallet and great grandmother's quilt. There are any number of ways to accomplish that. And then green burial dispenses with an outer burial container. So there's no vault or liner. We began the development of it by having a senior biologist come in and do a full biological evaluation of the site. Uh, highlighted environmentally sensitive areas where we are not going to be doing full body burials uh, to protect aquifer recharge zones. Catalog all of the existing flora, all of the plant life, native and invasive, helped us develop an integrated pest management plan to manage the invasive species with a minimum of chemical inputs, and then developed a site suitable plant list for us. For each burial that we do in the meadow, we plant three native plants on or near the the burial site, which is part of the ongoing restoration of the site and also part of the memorialization. How does that become part of the memorialization? The memorial plantings take place in the planting window in the Northwest, which is uh, in the late autumn through to the midwinter. So we're in that planting window right now. By virtue of having just that window of time to plant in, we are gathering with families anywhere from one to 24 months after the burial itself took place. 
which is interesting because some time has elapsed and some healing has occurred. And we are coming back and we're putting new life in the ground that this individual who's buried there is literally scientifically going to be nourishing as their body breaks down and re-enters the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle. The atoms, the molecules in their body are being taken up by the plants and feeding them and then being carried off by pollinators off into the world, allowing these molecules to participate in the natural cycles that they've participated in since they were forged in the furnaces of the stars. And we talk about this as we're putting this new life in the ground. And families come back and they tend these plants like they would plants in their garden. And we keep bare patches of earth weeded around them like we do plants in our garden. And families invest their healing and invest their sense of this individual into these memorial plants in a way that stone and metal just can't be quite invested in. It's a living, nurturing process that is a, a give and take with the site and that family, which can be a fascinating, active, participatory healing process for them. And we put these pockets of native plants in the ground. We tend to them, and then we put adjacent pockets in with each burial. And these pockets of native plants, as we tend to them, expand into one another and create these islands of native plants, these colonies of native plants that grow and with our help start to push out the invasive species. So over time then, this entire landscape becomes memorialization to everyone who's interred there. The restoration of this, uh, really taking this blighted field that has historically been plowed hundreds if not thousands of times to the point of all biodiversity being erased and having only invasive plants for the most part in place. Now returning it to a thriving native ecosystem becomes a memorial to every family, not just the individuals buried there, but every family who chose this option had the vision to participate in it and with their actions restored this landscape. So, Brian, I, I took you off point. Mm -hmm. uh, you were starting to give us a, an example of some of the different forms of memorialization and obviously the choice of the uh, plants to go around the interment site that the family makes is one of them. What are some of the others? So in the meadow, we also offer uh, more permanent memorialization in the form of native Washington stones, stones gathered in Washington state, kept in their raw form. So boulder, slab, craggy faced, very fascinating uh, stones with a lot of character that families get to pick out their specific stone. And then it goes to the monument company that we work with and is engraved much like a granite uh, marker would be. Names, dates, epitaphs, artwork, borders. Uh, actually, when they start working with the faces of the stones and the character of them, you really get some pretty fascinating inscriptions that come out that tell pretty unique stories. The passion of, of your words is wonderful. And when I hear you talk about sacred, mm -hmm. your reference is to the ground, the encapsulation of the body within that ground and, and the uh, visual and, and the use of that ground by, by the plant species and, and the air around it. Whereas when I hear the word sacred used by most cemeterians, it, it's more the stewardship of the protection mm -hmm. uh, of the body and the maintenance of, of the ground uh, from the top side up. And is this a difference be, between the green and the uh, classic old English cemeteries? I think there's a lot of parallels, Dan. You know, the word sacred means set apart. And a cemetery, regardless of it, it being a green cemetery or a conventional burial ground, is a place that is set apart. It is set apart from the hustle and bustle of our busy daily lives. It's often set apart from the landscapes that we interact with on our daily basis. It's someplace we go specifically. 
it's a place that people go to contemplate, to be with their emotions, their grief, their joy, their celebrations, their sadness, their happiness. It's a place they go to draw close to their memories of the deceased and their families. It's a place that they grow, go to draw close to the divine when they need that, however they define the divine. And I, I think that's true regardless of the nature of the cemetery, conventional or green. And that's really what I mean and intend when I say that the cemetery is sacred. It's a place that's set apart. What I'm highlighting in green cemeteries is that they are places that are designed to interact with people. And that makes them very special because they are pristine, conserved or restored ecological sites that interact with people, that people value because their loved ones are there because it is set apart for them, for their family. And, and I think that's true whether it is a cemetery in a uh, New England cemetery with private mausoleums and uh, expansive uh, uh, headstones that are carved by famous uh, sculptors or in a uh, conservation cemetery somewhere in the South that has only the natural features. They're still equally sacred. Wow. Um, thank you, Brian, for your time today. Uh, I, I, for those of you that want to reach out to Brian, there will be a link to his email address. You can drop him questions about uh, any of the passion points that he outlined for us today, funeral directing, cemetery, uh, green burial, and, and most importantly, based upon uh, the, the use and the passion of your words, storytelling. Hmm. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Dan. It was a privilege and an honor. So what did we learn today? We learned that when the going gets tough, the tough have to be creative. They've got to work a little bit harder. They have to be adapting to what you have in front of you. You have to be willing to consider alternatives. You have to be willing to embrace technology and use it properly. Not the minimal way, but to its maximum. And sometimes, maybe you have to be willing to listen to an idea a family has and help them fit it in to the resources you have available. If you want to reach Jay or Brian, we'll include their email address so that you could reach out to them. I want to thank Julie McAfee, my producer, Alex Klein, my videographer, my staff, and especially you, the viewer and reader for helping keep this relevant. In the event you have ideas that you want other columns to follow or other videos to follow, please drop me a note. If you like what we're doing, give us a thumbs up. And if you want to be alerted every time we publish new content on the video, please click on the YouTube subscribe. Most importantly, stay safe, roll up your sleeve, and let's get this chapter of our lives behind us. <laughs>